said that uh, we have a body, we have a mind, and we have a soul. And the body must be directed by the mind, and mind must be guided by the soul, if you want to master your life. And he said that what you think about, what you visualize, what you affirm, and speak to yourself about, how you feel about yourself, and the actions you take every single day, dictate your destiny. And so you have command over that, and it has nothing to do with what happens in the past, has nothing to do with what anybody's told you, has nothing to do with anything except what's inside you. What is going on, everybody? Welcome back, guys, to another amazing and very, very exciting episode of The Superman Life. As always, I'm your host, Frank Rich, and guys, I just want to start off by saying how incredibly grateful and thankful I am to have you here with me today. Uh, what an epic conversation. First and foremost, uh, what a true world changer do we have on, on the show? Somebody that uh, just work is impacting, I mean, millions upon millions of people. I'm going to get to intro in here in, in a minute, but uh, we have a first on the show here. Uh, we have the first guest uh, that is tuning in and recording with me from floating in the middle of the ocean. Uh, so our guest was, uh, was on his yacht that he, he lives on where he travels the world uh, speaking and, and researching, and uh, it was really unique. We ran into a couple of technical difficulties. As you guys know, sometimes doing these remote interviews, uh, you hit some issues technically, but uh, we were able to make it happen, guys. We were able to, uh, to get the conversation completed, and, uh, and, and I'm so looking forward to sharing this one with you today. It's one of those ones that as I'm just sitting back, I'm just learning um, every minute that, that, that I had a chance to be with him, and, and I'm looking forward to having him back on. We've already talked about uh, mm -hmm. scheduling a second one as we, uh, you know, get into early 2022. So if you enjoy this one, make sure to, uh, stick around cause we're going to be having him back on. But my guest today is none other than Dr. John Demartini. Dr. Demartini is a world renowned specialist in human behavior. He's a researcher, author, and global educator. He has developed a series of solutions applicable across all markets, sectors, and age groups. His education curriculum ranges from corporate empowerment programs, to financial empowerment strategies, self-development programs, relationship solutions, and social transformation programs. His teaching started at the core of the issue, addressing the human factor and range out to a multitude of powerful tools that have proven the test of time. Now, Dr. Demartini has studied over 30,000 books across all defined academic disciplines and has synthesized this wisdom of ages, which he shares on stage in over 100 countries. His presentations, whether they're keynotes, seminars, workshops, they leave clients with their insights into their behavior and keys to their empowerment. Now, Dr. Demartini has addressed public and professional audiences up to 11,000 at a time across the world and shared the stage with some of the world's most influential people, such as Sir Richard Branson, Stephen Covey, Steve Wozniak, uh, Apple, Apple co-founder, Robert Kiyosaki, Tony Fernandez, Wayne Dyer, Deepak Chokra, Donald Trump, and many, many more. From the thousands of testimonials he has received, Dr. T Demartini's work changes people's lives forever. And although I had him for an hour here today, a little bit less than an hour, this conversation went, I really think that today's conversation is, has the ability to impact and change your life. Um, so we start off and I just wanted to kind of get to know a little bit about like what, what got him into this? Like what motivates or inspires an individual to read 30,000 books uh, over the course of their life? So get a little bit of con you know context as to what's kind of, you know, lights up the martini from from the inside and it's truly uh, truly inspirational we then get into uh we talk about some of the differences between motivation and inspiration this is something that i've touched on here and you know some of my own work as well and i love that we kind of see things very similar uh but most of our conversation is centered around focusing on asking better questions uh you asking better questions you know your your future your values are dictated by the questions that you ask your questions will form and dictate your destiny. So we really dive dial into to that. And we talk about some of the hierarchy of values and, and where do our values come from and, and, and how can we begin to understand them at a deeper, more conscious level. And then we finish off the conversation with a free gift, a free giveaway that Dr. Demartini and his team was so gracious to share with us, which I know is going to impact you and motivate you guys. So, so yeah, if you guys are interested in getting more information and getting this free course and free resource, Click that link down there in the description box. Pick up the Awaken Your Astronomical Vision by Dr. John D. Martini. Uh, but as always, guys, 
We're so grateful to have you here with us. If you want to help us grow and continue to support this show, help us in one of two ways. First off, by leaving a five-star rating and written review, whether you're watching on Apple Podcasts, uh, watching on YouTube or listening on Spotify or any other platforms out there. But more importantly, I got to know, and, and I do believe that there's somebody in your life that needs to hear this conversation. So do us a favor and do them the blessing of sharing this conversation with them. Uh, without further ado, guys, let's get into today's conversation with Dr. John G. Martini. Dr. John, welcome to the Superman Life Podcast. Thank you for having me. We're looking forward to it. Yeah, really, really been looking forward to this one since it's, since it's been on the calendar. I mean, just... In, in, in researching you and I mean there's just an infinite amount of information that you've put on um, put out into into the world so hopefully we can articulate that into you know a, a valuable conversation and, and and my goal with every single episode is is to maybe get something shared that you haven't shared before uh, I know that's gonna be difficult with somebody that does as much teaching and lecturing and interviewing as you do um, but I, th- I I read or heard somewhere that that you've consumed or read Roughly thirty thousand books in your lifetime. A for one, is that is that is that claim accurate? And how does a person read thirty thousand books? I mean, I'm standing in front of twelve about twelve feet of bookshelves behind me, so there's roughly about three hundred. I read them, or I didn't read them. I, I counted them uh, over the weekend in, in preparation. There's about three hundred eighty books behind me. It's a lot when I when I think about reading three hundred books, but thirty thousand is a whole different level. So A is the claim accurate. And how does one person consume that much information in a lifetime? Well, the number is closer to 30,000. It's going on the 600 mark. I read every day. Um, I used to read typically four to seven books a day uh, when I was in my earlier 20s. It's a little slower now because of my schedule of speaking. But I had a dream to, you know, be a polymath and to devour as much as I could and stand on the shoulders as many people as I could. So that that's an, an accurate assessment. I've, I've been blessed. I, I had a dream when I was young at 18 to study the most universal principles that apply to the most amount of disciplines to build a foundation of knowledge that I could disseminate and share. And so I made it kind of a goal to read at least 100 books in every known discipline. And that was a bit of an undertaking, but I, some I've gone up to 14 or 1500 books in an area and some areas, maybe 30, but I've certainly averaged at least that. And so I, I made it a point to try to learn and have a, a grasp of many fields so I could select out of that, the most universal principles that have been consistently shown and revealed in those disciplines. That way I had something that would be more likely to be meaningful and lasting. I didn't want to create a fad. I didn't want to create a trend. I want to create a classic out of my life, something that would be useful for the, for anybody's life the rest of their life. No, I absolutely, absolutely love that. And, um, you know, I think I have very similar goals in, in mind. You know, like we were kind of chatting a bit before we got started. You know, I, I, I work in, you know, a very niche uh, marketplace or very niche uh, clients that I that I serve. But I really think what's enabled me to, you know, step in in the last 18 months and have the success that we've had both in our coaching with, you know, with, with our company is the fact that I have been studying human performance. I have been studying bodybuilding. You know, I have a background as a competitive bodybuilder. I have been studying self-development, human psychology, human nature. So much like you, as I try to, I try to seek out wisdom from some of the smartest, greatest minds in the world, but then decipher it down into a way that I could serve the people that are coming to me for help. So when you talk about these, these universal, yeah, when you talk about these universal disciplines, I mean, are there, are there, cause you, you said I wanted to read a book in every known discipline. So how many known disciplines are, are out there that we're, that we're studying? Well, I've cataloged and to keep a record of it, mine's at 300 disciplines right now. So, um, and that, and I've written on each of these areas. So I, I found that writing and presenting on the topic that I'm devouring assists me in inculcating that and making it part of my nature. So I write on these fields in addition to reading in these fields, in addition to trying to meet leaders in the fields. Um, and so I can have a grasp of that field sufficiently enough to find the most universal principles from it. 
for instance, there is basic law called the law of the one to many. And it applies in many, many fields. In astronomy, a star will radiate light from a point source out into an infinite number of radii, to the many radii. And gravity, which leads to darkness, will take an infinite number of radii and bring it down to a point source, from many to one and one to many. And so that's a principle that applies on that astronomical level. But it also applies in psychology. You have one real, true, authentic being, and you have many personas and masks that you wear. And the moment you try to integrate the mass in personal development, persona means mask, uh, to try to find the authentic being, you have a tendency also to be distracted by outer circumstances to diffract yourself back into the many. And when you're dating many, you're searching for the special one. But once you have the one, you're wondering about the many. And you have monarchies and democracies in sociology. And you have integral and, and differential calculus and mathematics. And in every field, you'll see this law of the one to many apply. And it applies in business, centralization, decentralization. It applies in economics, concentration towards a few, you know, that become very powerfully wealthy and the many that don't. So there's this law applies. And if you understand that law, there's many different applications you can do in human behavior to give yourself to work within the principles and law instead of fight it. So I'm interested in what those principles are that are universal. If I find them in every discipline, I know it's pretty universal. That means hundreds of different researchers have come to the same conclusion around the same principle. And that's what I want to build a foundation of to, to, to teach. So that's why I did it. I wanted to learn. I wanted to, to disseminate information that was solid. And I want to stand on the shoulders of great minds. Yeah, I love that. Um, how, how similar to the to, to what you were just explaining there is, would, would, would you describe maybe Pareto's principle? So, you know, the 80-20, which I know is a universal principle is, as well. Is, you know, is it, is it the same? Is it, is it, is it something completely different? Um, yeah, just speak to that if you can. Well, the Pareto principle was actually defined by Joseph Duran on business management until the very last day of his life. And he's the one that actually coined it, the Pareto principle, he extracted that and put that term together, the Pareto Principle. Pareto was an economist, and so he extracted that and put that term together. It wasn't limited to 80-20 only. It could be 90-10. It could be 9-9-1. It, it, but there was a, a general scheme of what they call a binomial equation associated with different expressions in business. Some people make it 25-75. That's actually the binomial mathematics. It's the same binomial mathematics that's seen in genetic expression with dominant and recessive alleles and genes. So the, the, that, those principles are solid and they are reflections of a balancing act between the law of the one to many. So it is a derivative of the law of the one to many. Mm. Nature has maximum efficiency of genetic expression and adaptation right between the law of the one to many. And seventy five twenty five matches that law of the one to many. Got it. That's 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 fascinating. Um, where did where did this thirst for for knowledge come from? Like you know, was was this something that the parent like your parents passed down to you? Were your parents in, intellects? Were they scholars? Um, did you you know were did you, did you grow up maybe kind of kind of isolated? So you're always seeking information. Where 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 did the thirst and desire for what you're doing come from? inside of you when i was a young boy born i was born in 1954 i had an arm and leg deformity it was turned inward and apparently by the time i was one and a half when i was supposed to make so sounds i didn't make proper sounds and so i had to go to a speech pathologist to practice using muscles with strings and buttons in my mouth so i had a bit of a speech impediment then I turned five, or no, six and seven, right at that first grade mark, I tried to learn to read. And my teacher, no matter what happened, I wasn't making progress. I ended up in the normal, then, uh, then remedial, and finally had to wear a dunce cap. So I was handicapped, as they called it, 
and we had to wear a dunce cap when I was in first grade. This is 1960. The teacher asked my parents to come to school, and my parents came, and they, the teacher said, I'm afraid your son will never be able to read. He'll never be able to write. He probably won't communicate effectively. He won't be able to probably, you know, go very far in life or amount to anything. So the only thing I was decent at, it was running, because when I, I had to wear braces from one and a half to four on my arm and leg. When I got out of them, all I wanted to do is run and be free. So when I met Paul Bragg, my life changed that day. And I saw in a vision that I would overcome my learning problems, someday learn how to read, learn how to be intelligent and become a teacher. And I saw a vision of me speaking in front of a million people, which I could show you a picture of it because it's been painted now with an iconic building from every major city around the world in the background to try to be a man with a message to bring a message to the world. And that was such an epiphany that night that I started to go and try to learn how to read, which led me back to flying back to California, hitchhiking back to Texas, taking a GED, figuring out a way of finishing. I never did finish high school, getting a GED and then going on to passing that test and eventually trying to go back to college. And I failed at first, but my mom saw me crying in the living room one day and said, what happened, son? And I said, I, I blew the test. I guess I don't have what it takes. I guess I'll never be able to read, write, communicate, never mount a thing, never go very far in life. And she said, son, whether you become a great teacher, philosopher, and travel the world like you dream, whether you return back to Hawaii and ride giant waves, or whether you return to the streets and panhandle as a bum, I just want to let you know that your father and I are going to love you no matter what you do. And when she said that, my hand went into a fist. And I said to myself, I'm going to master this thing called reading and studying and learning. I'm going to master this thing called teaching, healing, and philosophy. And I'm going to do whatever it takes. I'm going to travel whatever distance. I'm going to pay whatever price to give my service of love across this planet. I got up. I hugged my mom. I went in my room. I got a dictionary out. And I started memorizing 30 words a day. And she tested me. I had to spell them, pronounce them, put them in a sentence, and use them. And I just kept building my vocabulary until 30 words a day until I could start to read and pass school. And then once I started getting the hang of that, I started living to read, you know, every day, all day. And that's what led me to asking what worked, what didn't work, how do I read more effectively? And eventually into getting very proficient at it and eventually reading, you know, 18 and 20 hours a day and reading faster and faster and faster until I read one day 11,000 pages, and I still retain much of that. So I, I found out that we had more capacity than I ever realized, and I just wanted to learn. I just wanted to fill my mind with the greatest ideas to catch up with all the other kids, and I never stopped. I've been doing it 49 years now. Yeah, God, God bless Paul Paul Bragg. I think that's that's what you said his name was. I mean, single man, I mean, you may not even know it, but because of the impact he had on you, you've gone on to impact millions. I mean, tens of millions, potentially hundreds. I don't, I'm, I'm assuming your, I mean, your videos are probably being, it may be over a billion views. Um, so do you recall what he said? Like, was there something that just jumped out at you or was it just the entire yeah. message in, in, in general? Because he said it made you feel like for the first time that you thought potentially you could be intelligent. Like it, a, a part of me is like, kind of like, man, I, I, I feel for little John to think that like the little kid before that didn't think that he had the potential to be intelligent, but what a, what a paradigm shifting moment in, in your life. So, so what was it that Paul said? Well, I had confidence in surfing, just not reading and learning. Mm. I could ride a big wave. I read 40 foot waves in those days, but I couldn't read. I had asked the kids around me to, to read for me. So it wasn't that I was not ambitious. I just didn't have academics. But what he said that night, and these are just a few of the pieces, because he said a lot. He said that uh, we have a body, we have a mind, and we have a soul. And the body must be directed by the mind, and mind must be guided by the soul if you want to master your life. And he said that what you think about, what you visualize, what you affirm, and speak to yourself about how you feel about yourself and the actions you take every single day dictate your destiny. And so 
you have command over that, and it has nothing to do with what happens in the past, has nothing to do with what anybody's told you, has nothing to do with anything except what's inside you. And then he said, you want to set goals for yourself, your family, your community, your city, your state, your nation, your world, and beyond for 120 years. And so I started doing that. I got on a little piece of paper and a little pencil, and I started writing down what I what would I really love to do. And the thing that I wanted to do is I wanted to, I wanted to learn to be able to speak properly. I wanted to learn to be able to read. And I wanted to be intelligent. And I wanted to travel the world. And I wanted to share anything that was inspiring like this gentleman was to me. I wanted to share something. I wanted to be of contribution to such a degree that what I had to say, people would want to hear it. And I wanted to make a difference. And that set me on a pursuit to try to overcome my learning problems, which I eventually did. I love that. Absolutely. Absolutely love that. I want to, I want to, you know, get into, you know, some tactics here that we can, you know, pass along to, to the audience here. Just, I mean, like I said, there's just so much that, that you and I can get into. I think because you mentioned that, that you had this vision back then and it's now become a painting and I'm sure, you know, that vision kind of obviously still sits at the forefront and, and foundation of everything that you're doing. If you can't speak to the importance of us having a vision for what we want or who we, who we want to become, and then we can really kind of zoom in for people that are maybe struggling to find that vision or, or, or find that purpose in and of their life. So yeah, let's, let's, let's open up the conversation on, on vision and just the importance of having an aim that we're moving towards. Okay. So every human being lives moment by moment by a set of priorities, a set of values, things that are most important to least important in their life. And every decision they make, every perception they, they make, every action they take is responsive to these, these values. These values dictate that. The hierarchy of your values dictates your destiny. And every decision is based on what you believe will give you the greatest advantage over disadvantage at any moment. Now, whatever is highest on the hierarchy of values and list of values, priorities that people have, is spontaneously inspired. You're spontaneously inspired to fulfill. It's just like a video game for a young boy who loves video games. He doesn't have to be motivated to do it. I don't need to be motivated to research and teach. I love it. But whatever is low on your value, you have to have motivation to get you to do it extrinsically. You need a reward or a punishment mentality. And motivation is never anything but a symptom. It's never a solution for human beings. It's always a symptom. It means you're going after something that's not truly important to you. So I'm not a motivational speaker. What's truly important to you is intrinsically called from within. You spontaneously want to act on it. Now, whenever you're living by your highest value, the blood glucose and oxygen goes into the forebrain. And whenever you try to live by lower values, your blood glucose and oxygen goes into the amygdala and the hindbrain. The one when it's in the forebrain is for thrival. When it goes in the hindbrain and the amygdala, it goes into survival. So any any time you live in alignment congruently with what you value most, because the blood glucose and oxygen goes to the forebrain, it inspires vision. Because that area of the brain is linked to the V5, V6 of the associative areas in the occipital cortex and gives you a, grabs you a whole bunch of information to help you see what it is that you want to create. Those with a vision flourish, those without a vision perish. People in the amygdala can't see it, but people in the forebrain can see it. They also have strategic planning. So you automatically see strategies on how to get what you want to navigate through all the challenges and obstacles and mitigate the risk along the way. And it also has spontaneous action, which is an execution in the accessory motor cortex. And it also sends fibers down into the amygdala to calm down with glutamate and GABA. It calms down the impulses and instincts that distract us from what's important to us. So we maximize our potential to the degree that we live by what's highest in our values. And that's why determining what's really, 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 really spontaneously inspiring and important to you and setting goals at a really high priority and only those is the key to having an inspired vision and allowing yourself to build momentum that's unstoppable. Because our mission, our teleological mission is an expression of what we value most. Our ontological state of being and identity revolves around what we value most. 
our epistemological desire to know and learn and maximize our learning potential is always around our highest value. So if you can identify what that is and fill your day with the highest priority actions that inspire you, your day won't fill up with low priority distractions that don't. And that makes you unstoppable and masterful at what you do. So where does one get started with determining what their their highest values are? I mean, are we are we talking, um, you know, values for necessary for for survival? So, you know, we have we have the hierarchy of needs or is this going deeper and beyond in, in, in more of a philosophical um, approach to it? So. So, yeah, where can one begin to assess what their values are? Yeah, each individual, if you're in a third world or, a, you know, country, you may be in survival mode. And so your values will be there. And if you're, you know, traveling the world like I'm doing around on a yacht or whatever, then you may be in another level. But the point is, whatever your level of values are at that time, whatever's highest will always be at the highest. There's always going to be something that's high at every stage. And whenever you do, it tends to keep growing up. You tend to develop socioeconomically upward if you do. So there's a way of determining, because if you just ask somebody, what are your values? I guarantee they're going to tell you social idealisms, things that they learn from mothers, fathers, preachers, teachers, convention, traditions, and mores. None of that means anything. I'm not interested in what you say. I'm interested in what you live. I'm, I, I'm interested in how you fill your space and what is your, in your personal and intimate space most. Because whatever is in your, that you keep right in your space within reach is what's valuable to you. Everything else you push away. I look at what you spend your time on. You make time, find time, spend time on things that are really important to you. I look at what energizes you. Because when you're doing something that's high in your values, your energy goes up. When you're doing something low in your values, your energy goes down. I look at where you spend your money. You always find money, spend money, and make money for things that are valuable to you. And it's where it's dispersed. And you don't have money. You don't want to spend money on things that aren't. I look at where you're most organized. I look at where you're most disciplined. I look at what you think about, visualize, and affirm internally about how you want your life that shows evidence coming true. If there's no evidence, it's a fantasy. And, it's not, and if it's not something you're really wanting, it's, it's something that you're beating yourself up because you're trying to be somebody you're not. Then I look at what you want to converse with other people about. What do you want to converse and talk to people about most and bring the conversations to and engage in most? What inspires you and brings tears to your eyes when you think about it? And what's common to the people who inspire you? They bring tears of, of real inspiration to you. What is it that's the most consistent, persistent goals that you have been pursuing that you are showing definite evidence of achieving? And what is it you spontaneously want to learn? And what do you want to study and read and watch on videos? What do you want to fill your mind with? All of those, if they're answered with honesty, will point a pattern, a consistent pattern that will reveal what's most important, second most important, third most important, etc. And you'll get to see a hierarchy of values, not by what just arbitrarily you pick out of the air from some social idealisms, but what your life actually demonstrates. I'm only interested in what your life demonstrates, nothing else. Because if you set a goal that is truly most important to you, you'll excel. And many people bang their head against the wall, you know, trying to be somebody they're not. Being second at somebody else is never as great as being first at being you. That one, that one hits home for me personally as, as somebody that, that failed in trying to build my first online business because I was, I was basically trying to become a, a, a secondary version of, of somebody else that, that I saw. And everything that I'm doing today between the podcast and Rebuilt and the coaching that we're doing, um, you know, help, helping guys over, overcome in porn has come out of very similar to you, like your own struggle. Like you had these learning disabilities, what you perceive to be a lack of, of um, in, intelligence. And now your entire life is centered around seeking more information than articulating and then pass that along to other people. It's like your test becomes your testimony for, for me. Like I, I had this dream of inspiring and leading others, but I had to get out of my own way and, 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 and be, and, and, and remove some of my own barriers first. And I think what, what you're saying there, it's like what you value the most. I think one of the greatest examples is we can look at drug addicts, you know, somebody that's, that's, that's got a heroin addiction or crack addiction. Like they wake up, every single day with one focus in mind. How do I get money to get my next hit? It's like their their highest value is figuring out a way to make money. And it's like, if you could pass it along to entrepreneurs that struggle to like get a business off the ground, it's like we could pass along that 
clarity of focus, singularity of focus of, of, of achieving one goal in, 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 in mind. So well, love, can I share something going. about that? Frank, can I, can I say something about that? In the hierarchy of values that we have, whenever we're pursuing the highest, we are most objective and most neutral in awareness, which means that objectivity means neutrality. We're not subjectively biased. We're just able to see both sides of things. But whenever we're doing lower values, we get less and less fulfillment and we activate the amygdala. And the amygdala is a center, a desire center. It's not the executive center, it's the desire center. And the desire center wants to avoid predator and wants to seek prey. It wants to avoid difficulty and seek ease. It wants to avoid pain and seek pleasure. So impulsive, compulsive, immediate gratifying, addictive behaviors are compensations for unfulfilled highest values. So usually addictions are a result of events in their life that were extremely painful that they're wanting to avoid and they dissociate from that, that experience into something that makes them not have to feel that experience. And as a result of it, if they, they haven't seen how that experience is on the way in their life, they see it in the way and therefore they're trying to dissociate. If all of a sudden you take those traumatic experiences that may have con initiated the reason for the addiction and find out how it serves them and how it was actually a gift in their life and see it on the way, they automatically start to perceive things back in their highest values. And that is the area of the brain that actually calms down the amygdala and reduces the probability of the addictive behavior. Wow. Um, just processing all this and, 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 and running it kind of through, you know, my own, my own experience here, like, like everything that I'm doing. Yeah. I could have been a victim. I could have, you know, allowed a, a 20 year addiction to pornography to keep me shackled or, or keep me from opening up. But I had a goal. I had a dream to help and inspire others. I had a, I had a vision to have a podcast that would reach hundred plus countries and thousands of people every single week. But it was, it was making that experience, the traumatic experience of my life struggles, getting it and reframing it, re reframing the perspective of how I saw it as the opportunity to launch the show because the first episode was me just talking about how my life changed when I got on, on, on the other side of this. Um, Frank, do, man, you, this is do you mind like, if I make a comment just for watching you? Please. Yeah. Do you know Neil deGrasse Tyson, the, the astronomer? Mm -hmm. If there, there's a video that he did that talked about his, he was speaking at a podium uh, in front of a podium on a podium in front of a lectern at some university, a prof professorship. And he was talking about what inspired him to do what he's doing and how it was almost a religious experience for him in the sense it was so inspiring to him. And your mannerisms, your, the way you express and the way you were inspired just a moment ago reminded me of that presentation. So just like Neil deGrasse is one of the great leaders in the field of astronomy and bringing that to the world and bringing his message to the public, I just saw that for just a moment in you. I just really, pardon me for just saying that, but you just... You were almost a, the same type of inspiration that he had for his, his dream to be an astronomer. It shows in what you're doing. So I just wanted to say that. Pardon me for interrupting there. No, no. This is like like I told you. Like what we we just have a conversation, and, and very fortunate and blessed that people are interested in in hearing what intrigues me. Um, I talk a lot about motivation and, and and inspiration. You know, I get guys reaching out to me. I don't feel motivated, you know, to, to not give in to the temptation. I don't give, you know, I don't feel motivated the entire time of my life. I don't feel motivated to go to the gym. And, and I flip it. I've, I've used that whole, you know, the, the exact same way that you've broken it down. Like motivation requires motives. It's external, you know, it requires an external source. It's like once you're inspired, like living in spirit, it's like you, you feel the pull to go to go do these things. So if there's a guy out there and he's, and he's hearing this, he's like, I want to, you know, I want to get clear on, on, on my highest values for, for myself. I, I feel maybe I'm just kind of shuffling through life, like no real aim, no clear direction. I don't feel motivated or inspired any of the time. Where can a guy even begin to get started to figure out what are his values? What is his highest values? And then kind of, you know, building his life in and around that. Where's the first place to get started? I've been involved in researching of values for 44 years. And um, on my website, drdmartini.com. 
is a free private questionnaire that any human being can ask. We have people from companies, governments, general people, all different people. They go on there, take 30 minutes of their time, and go and answer 13 questions as honestly as they can. And it automatically takes you through the questions and prints out a little print if you want to print it and gives you a summary of what the values are at this moment. And then I would do it again a week from now, a month from now, maybe a quarter from now, and get a glimpse in case you didn't want to tell the truth to yourself and look for the pattern. Because a lot of times you don't want to face the truth about what's important. I had a lady in London one time that said, I don't know what I, my real value and purpose is. Her life was demonstrating kids, but she was comparing herself to a businesswoman and thinking it's not good enough. And I explained to her, Rose Kennedy's mission statement was that I dedicate my life to raising a family of world leaders. It was good enough. It doesn't matter what it is. There's, there, every human being has a unique set of values. And some people are dedicated to intellectual pursuits. And some are dedicated to business mastery. And some people are dedicated to wealth building. And some are into family management. And some are into social causes and influence. And some are into physical health and well-being and beauty. And some are into spiritual quest. There is no right or wrong value structure. You're not here to compare yourself to anybody here. Only to compare your own daily actions to your own highest values and dreams. So, but people compare themselves to others and put people on pedestals and inject the values of others and cloud the clarity of what's meaningful to them and that's intrinsic. And they're clouded by all the extrinsic shoulds and supposed tos and got tos and have tos and must and need tos instead of what it is that they would really love to do in life. And so going on that, on the drdmartini.com, I know will be insightful. We've had thousands and thousands of people take advantage of that. But it's free, it's complimentary, it's private. Take advantage. Yeah, guys, we'll definitely get that linked up. Why is it so hard for humans to tell the truth? Whether it's to themselves or, or to others? That's a great question. Thousands of years ago, we really don't know. Every decade, we push back human beings' origins. But hundreds of thousands of years ago, possibly, when man was supposedly nomadic, he didn't always survive well by himself. So he tended to join with groups, little clusters. And then that they started to having, well, you know, you're good at making a basket. You're good at, at uh, cooking. You're good at hunting. And specialties emerged. And then when we had sedentary seed formation and we planted seeds and came out of nomadic in that area and herding, we came into now the sedentary life. Everybody started having specialties and we became more and more dependent on other people. And so the fear of rejection, the fear of abandonment, the fear of abolishment and exile from the herd, the collective, is anxious for people. And so when they're around people that they think their opinions are more important than their own, they're afraid to tell the truth for fear of rejection many times. See, I found that people are not honest or dishonest, they're just human beings. And if they feel that there's going to be more advantage telling the truth, they'll do it. If they think there's going to be more advantage, not. They're going to, the risk-reward ratio says not because they don't want to be rejected. They don't want to be put down. They don't want to lose opportunity. The two basic fears in people's life is the fear of loss of that which they seek and the fear of gain of that which they're trying to avoid. And that drives people to be honest or dishonest according to the, the assessment at that moment with the people involved. And so that has a lot to do with why we are in, uh, in, you know, inauthentic with ourselves, Because if all of a sudden we realize, my God, my mom wants me to be a, a this, and my dad wants to be an engineer, and, and, and everybody at the school says I should be doing this, and my counselor says I ought to be doing this, but my heart is, you know, video games or something. Uh, what, you know, if I don't see how I can make a great living doing what I love, I feel like I, I have to fit in, or I have to do this, or I... I still depend on, and anybody you depend on, anybody you subordinate to, anybody you put on a pedestal is going to skew your integrity on what you give on an answer. Speak, speak to that, like monetizing your, your highest value or monetizing your, you know, what you, what you aspire to do. You know, I run into this all the time. Like 
Frank, I'm not you. I don't, you know, I don't inspire to coach and, and create content. You know, my purpose, like, you know, what lights me up inside is video games or is basket weaving or, or whatever it is. You know, basket weaving is probably not the, the, the greatest example for our audience. But, you know, a lot of people believe that, like, maybe they can't monetize their values or maybe they can't monetize, like, their, what, what they feel is, is their deepest or highest calling. Like, speak to that a little bit because I've, I've, I've heard you talk about this on, on some other podcasts, how we can, we can make a living doing really anything. If you ask seven questions, maybe you can, everybody can hear these seven questions. What is that I would absolutely love to do in life? What does my life demonstrate I am spontaneously inspired to do on a daily basis that I love doing? Ask that question and be honest with yourself. Then ask yourself, how could I get handsomely and beautifully paid to do that? And don't go, I don't know. Don't stop. Look. Then ask yourself, what are the highest priority action steps I can do today, starting today and every day, that will move me in the direction of monetizing what that is? The next one is, what obstacles might it run into and how do I solve them in advance? Then ask, what worked today and what didn't work today? And then what the next question is, is what, how do I do it more effectively and efficiently tomorrow? And then the last question is, how did whatever happened to me today, how did it help me move one step closer towards that objective? Those seven questions are very powerful. Now, I don't care what it is. Somebody out in the world has values and needs. They have, they have, they have needs that need to be met. It's about translating what you love to do into something that is valuable to other people. And the more value it has to other people, the more monetization you can make. It's that simple. I have yet to do it. I, I, can I share a really wild story of one? Absolutely. I'm teaching one of my signature programs 20-something years ago in New York. I've done this program 1,135 times. It's a two-day, 24 hours with me program. I'm breaking through whatever you perceive in the way to getting what you want in life. And this lady is 29 years old, I believe, sitting right in front of me, right in the front row. And the, we had U-shaped tables, you know, large U-shapes and another U-shape outside it. This girl was sitting right up in the front, so I picked on her. I said, so what is it you would absolutely love to do in life? And she goes, uh, she didn't know. It was just like, put her on the spot. No, what do you want to, what will you absolutely love doing in life? What do you spontaneously do every day that you love doing? She said, spend time with my dog. I love playing with my dog. Okay, great. How could you get handsomely and beautifully paid to spend time with your dog? She goes, I have no idea. I, 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 I didn't ask. You didn't have no idea. That's not the answer. You didn't, you dodged the question. How could you get handsomely paid doing that? She goes, I don't know. I didn't ask that. How could you get handsomely paid to do that? And finally she said, he's really cute. People like taking pictures. Maybe I could charge for it. Great. What are the highest priority actions you can do right now to move in that direction? And she goes, da, 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 da. And we wrote down six or seven things. And we started her on this journey of asking these questions. Then something really cool happened. She left the seminar on Sunday. And Monday, she took her dog walking in Central Park down the little avenue where all the philosopher, you know, chairs are. And you go down where the fountain is, where the, near the lake, where the little boathouse is. So she's literally walking down there with her dog. And for the first time in her life, she never had the courage to ever ask anybody or tell somebody if they asked, can I take a picture of your dog? She's always just let them take a picture. In those days, there were cameras. There was no iPhones. And so somebody came up to her and said, can I have a picture of your dog? And she said, well, that will be $5. And the person pulled out a $5 bill and handed it to her. And she walked home that night and told the dog, I said, you made your, you made your food keep today. You did, did good. Well, when that happened, she got a little creative. And she then went into the closet that night sat on the floor in a little tailor position, rummaged through the closet, and found some red elastic fabric and also some elastic strip. And she got a creative idea. She made a tube and sewed it into a tube that went between the, the fore legs and the, the hind legs. And then she made a little strap for some sunglasses that she had. And she made this thing where he could wear sunglasses and it would hold it to his head tight. And this little tube on that was red that would make it where people would probably want to take a picture more. And then she practiced prouncing him up on the hind legs 
So when he walked, he had sunglasses and a red outfit on and people go, I got to take a picture of that. So she went into the thing and she made 15 bucks the second day. 15 bucks. Now she's going, you know, you're now making me some money. You're not just cost. You're making your keep. Now you're making me some cash for flowing. So she got more creative and she started making different outfits for him that would draw attention. If you went online right now and you looked up Karen Beal, K-A-R-E-N-B-I-E-H-L, and you looked up her, her, her name, just type in her name and brought, brought up, hit images after you get her name. You will see this little chihuahua in many, many, many outfits from tuxedos to um, Hugh Hefner's robes to um, turkey outfits for turkey to Christmas outfits, the Pope's outfit. She started getting creative with the designs where more and more people wanted to take pictures. She got up to $125 in a day taking pictures of the dog. She got cards made that she was the agent of the dog made him a celebrity to some degree. And a guy walks up to her and says, that was cool, man. I just, I've been watching you for here while I'm eating, eating away something here. He said, look, I'm in, in um, marketing and I think I could use your dog maybe in a commercial. And she said, well, I'm his agent. Here, he'd call, here's my number. Now watch this. She did a deal with this guy for the Milk Bone Dog Biscuit commercial for $2.2 million. She did two other commercials. You can go online and see all this. You look up, his name is Eli, the little dog. She did two other commercials. Then she turned that into three television shows, a series for moms and dogs, mommies and doggies it's called. That dog became one of the most famous dogs next to Gidget, which became the Taco Bell dog. And she ended up retiring 20 something years with 25 million. I mean, she made 100 million to have her retired to 25 million out of the dog. And the dog died and she got another dog to replace it. That dog died, replaced it with another one and kept him three generations. Nobody knew the difference. But she made a fortune out of the dog because she asked quality questions. The quality of our life is based on the quality of the questions we ask. And I'm not saying to go out and get a chihuahua right now to make your fortune. I'm just saying that that's the least likely individual you would think to be able to become financially independent. But that one set of questions led her on a new path of how to live her life. So she was doing what she loved and she had a blast. They ended up hiring, getting a big penthouse in New York in the dog's name. The dog owned the penthouse. I mean, it was amazing how they organized the thing. So it's good publicity. So this just goes to show you that if you ask the right questions and you don't come up with, I don't know the answers, but you come forward and look and get creative what you can do. Because there's always something you can do that can serve another human being. If you care about humanity, to care enough to find out what their needs are and articulate what you do in terms of those needs, the door of opportunity financially is there. That is a beautiful, beautiful story. And it just shows the power of, of attracting as, as well. It's like once you got clear on who she was, what she wanted and her highest value. It's not like she had to go start knocking on doors. It's like, I just kept doing the same things that I was, but I don't know if it's energy, like her energy shifted or, or she, she saw the opportunities as they were coming to her because she now knew what she was, was looking for. But it's like, once you kind of get clear on who you are and who you're trying to become, it's like the, the, the things start being attracted to you. It's like, you don't have to go out and, and start looking. It's like with this podcast, I didn't know what the hell I was doing in, in, in the beginning. Like I wanted to talk into a microphone and put it out into the world. But when I got clear on, on doing that, it's like, okay, find the producer to help to help me edit it. Find find the person gonna help me set everything up on the website. Find the person gonna help me get on Apple. It's like, once you're clear on what you want, and I'm assuming you, 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 you can second this, it's like, the things start being attractive or they start showing up in, in your life. It's like you start manifesting these things in your life, correct? People, people, places, things, ideas, and events synchronize according to your innermost dominant thought. Your innermost dominant thought becomes your outermost tangible reality. The key is to not waste your time thinking on anything other than what's most truly meaningful, inspiring, and highest in your values. If you, if you don't fill your day with high priority actions that inspire you, your day fills up with low priority distractions that don't. If you don't fill your day with challenges that inspire you, it fills up with challenges that don't. So it's up to you to define what that is. That's why I tell people to go to the drdmartini.com website and just do the value determination process. It will be a very important step in that direction. 
yeah, guys, we'll uh, we'll get that link down there in in the show notes. We also have a free gift from Doctor uh, Doctor Martini's team, Awaken Your Astronomical Vision, uh, which we'll include there as well. So we'll get all that stuff linked down there. Um, but but is there anything you want to we'll plug here? I know we're coming up on uh, on on our, on our time here together. I, I would love to have you back on because I just feel like we could get into to so much more. Um, so maybe at some point in the future we can have you back on, Doctor John. So um, yeah, but but where can people? You know, we got the website. You know, what's what's kind of hot on pressing for for you right now? Any 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 big things kind of you're working on, or, or or where can people connect with you inside of outside of the website? I'm, I'm working on things. I'm working on things every day. I'm constantly researching, writing, traveling, and teaching. So I, that's what I love doing. I don't, I've delegated everything except research, write, travel, teach. I don't have to do it. I haven't driven a car in 32 years. I haven't cooked since I was 24. I don't do administrative, I don't do anything. I don't do anything but research, write, travel, teach. Because if you don't fill your day with the highest priorities, it's going to fill up with low priorities. And low priority things d- devalue you. You want to value mm. yourself? Stick to the highest values of actions on a daily basis. So I don't have anything to sell other than. I want to give them that uh, awakening your astronomical vision because I'm certain if they were to listen to that multiple times, it will give them a permission to go out and play a bigger game. And they can just go to my website and take advantage of the website. The website is just filled with educational materials. You've probably seen it. It's filled with YouTubes. It's filled with radio, television, newspapers, magazine, everything. Please take advantage of it, whoever's maybe uh, wanting to go and expand their, their potential in life. Absolutely, guys. Uh, check check all this out. We'll link everything that Dr. John has available. We'll get his YouTube. We'll get his Instagram. I mean, you heard it here in the short window that we have. I mean, one of the most researched individuals that we've had the pleasure of, of speaking. So, Dr. John, I, I appreciate you so much. Um, we're going to have to get you back on. So, so I'll, I'll, I'll connect with the team there. Uh, but I know you got some things you got to get to. So once again, thank you for your time here today. I think that this is obviously going to help and serve a lot of our men out there, just helping them get clear on their values, helping them get clear on what they want in, in, in finding what their highest values are in their life. So appreciate so much, Dr. John, for you guys out there. Thank you for tuning in here. If you want to continue to help us grow and support this show, you can help us in one of two ways. First off, leave us that five-star rating if you haven't done so yet. They're on Apple or whatever platform you're listening to. But most importantly, if there's somebody in your life that needs to hear this message today, maybe they're struggling with what their values are. Maybe they're struggling with what their vision or having a clear aim they want in life. Today's conversation is the one that they need to hear. So do us a favor with sharing this with at least one person. Uh, But for Dr. John Dr. John Martini, Frank Rich, guys, we love you. And we'll see you next week.